Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions, and this portfolio is social justice, housing and local government. I remind members that questions four and five are grouped together and uh, that I would take any supplementaries on these questions after both have been answered. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letters RTS during the relevant question. I call question number one, Michelle Thompson. Ask the Scottish Government what discussions it had with local government about any impact the prevailing economic conditions are having on the delivery of local services. Minister Ben McPherson. Ministers and officials meet COSLA and also individual local authorities on a regular basis to cover a range of issues, including support and delivery of frontline services. The budget acknowledges the corrosive effect of inflation on our finances and those of all public services. Um, Recognising these challenges, last week the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government wrote jointly to COSLA to reaffirm our commitment to working with local government on how we can operate and collaborate uh, on reform to ensure sustainable people-centred services. I, I thank the Minister for that response. And, and like the Scottish Government, my local council of Falkirk has been affected by economic chaos overseen by the Tory-led Westminster Government. Inflation in particular is a huge issue with a resultant impact on costs to deliver key services and capital projects. What further fiscal flexibilities is the Scottish Government considering for councils as they too struggle with the latest wave of Westminster austerity? Minister. I think the member raises really important points and the Scottish Government are working uh, alongside uh, COSLA and SOLAS to agree a new deal for local government in Scotland that will give councils, councils greater certainty uh, and flexibility and greater scope for discretionary revenue raising, uh, including uh, potential changes to council tax uh, and the introduction of a local visitor levy bill uh, to Parliament in due course. H however, we would also welcome further uh, suggestions uh, from local government, and we, we make that point to them regularly, uh, and will engage uh, constructively on, on, on uh, proposals that are raised by local government and, and others. Uh, however, we would also welcome support from across the Parliament as the Scottish Government continues to press the UK Government for additional funding to invest in our public services, including the key priorities that we share with our partners in local government. I call question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I draw members' attention to my register of interest, which shows that I am an owner of, of a rental property in North Lanarkshire, and to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what guidance it gives to landlords in all sectors to help prevent and deal with damp, condensation and mould in their properties, including when this was last revised. Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Housing Regulator wrote to all social landlords on the 1st of December 2022 on the importance of appropriate systems to identify cases of mould and damp. The regulator works with the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers to identify and promote good practice. For private landlords, the tolerable standard, which includes standards on dampness, was incorporated into the repairing standard in 2019. This means that issues can be raised to the first tier tribunal, who have powers to require landlords to carry out repairs to meet the standards. Mark Griffin. Thank uh, the Minister for that answer. I, I think most people would agree it's um, utterly uh, devastating that it's taken the tragic case um, of Awa Bishak for damp mould and condensation to rise up the, the agenda um, in the, the public debate. But in Scotland, beyond the estimates from the Scottish House Conditions Survey, we don't actually have an entirely accurate picture of how bad the issue is. There, there are no statistics from the government or regulator that allows us to identify um, the problem, particular problem areas or, or buildings. Um, and I just wonder if the, the government would uh, instruct an urgent data review um, across local authorities, registered landlords and private sector associations um, and commit to issue interim guidance on how to tackle this issue, which seems to be uh, more and more commonplace, certainly amongst MSP colleagues in boxes. Minister. Uh, 
Well, I would certainly uh, share Mark Griffin's uh, sentiment about the, the case of Awab Ishak and the reaction that that's provoked uh, right throughout uh, the, the UK, including in Scotland. I think it is worth reinforcing uh, that Scottish housing has been improving uh, in 2019, the Scottish House Conditions Survey did show that 91% of homes in Scotland were completely free from any sign of damp or condensation, and that is an improvement uh, from 86% uh, in 2012. Now, there is, of course, still much more to do, and that is why uh, we will be consulting on a new cross-tenure housing standard, which will move beyond traditional models of fitness for human habitation to a new model that meets uh, people's expectations for housing as a human right uh, and delivers homes uh, that underpin health and well-being. But Mark Griffin is right to continue to say that there is more that we need to do and we will keep this area under active consideration. Supplementary Miles Briggs. Presiding officer, the, um, in terms of damp and mould, though, the Minister will be aware though, that survey has pointed towards 14 per cent of social sector homes having either mould or damp issues. Um, so can I ask specifically whether or not the Scottish Government will now look at a reporting system being put in place to track this within uh, the socially rented sector and potentially that could also then be extended? Minister. Well, I have uh, in my first answer to, to Mark Griffin uh, set out the requirements that already exist on the social rented sector. Landlords are required to meet the Scottish Housing Quality Standard as part of the Scottish Housing Charter, the, the Social Housing Charter, I beg your pardon, uh, and progress against that is monitored by the Scottish Housing Regulator. Guidance on meeting these standards, uh, including detailed advice on dealing with issues of dampness, is already provided uh, to social landlords and is regularly updated, uh, as well as the, uh, the work that we're doing on the, uh, the um, repairing standard, which is due to come on into force uh, next year for the private rented sector. So I would reinforce that significant work is continually underway on this area, uh, and we will continue to ensure uh, that uh, any further actions are taken in the future. Supplementary, Mary McNair. Thank you, President Officer. The inability of a household to properly heat their home can make a uh, problem of mould and dampness occurring much worse. Can the Cabinet Secretary underline what support is available for households in Scotland who aim to improve energy efficiency and lower the energy bills while keeping their homes warm and damp free? Uh, well, I'm grateful for the inadvertent promotion, but uh, Home Energy Scotland is our uh, flagship domestic energy efficiency service. Uh, it provides free and partial advice on energy efficiency, renewable heating and fuel poverty, and it provides support uh, for people in Scotland to, to go greener at home as well as reducing their bills. Home Energy Scotland is the main referral point for our funding schemes, including our national fuel poverty scheme, Warmer Homes Scotland uh, and the new Home Energy Scotland grant and loan. We are also investing £64 million in 2023-24 as part of our locally delivered area-based schemes, enabling more fuel poor households to benefit from a whole house retrofit. And I, uh, as I have in the past, I would encourage all members to make sure that their constituents are aware of these uh, forms of support and advice. And supplementary, Peter Swishet. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. What more can the Scottish Government do to provide practical tools and guidance for landlords to measure damp condensation and mould issues and advice and support to tenants to establish the correct insulation and ventilation in modern and older homes in order to prevent such an instance as that that happened with the two-year-old in England? Minister. Well, I think several of the uh, areas of activity that I've already mentioned do go some way to uh, addressing the, the member's question, in particular the advice and support that's available uh, through Home Energy Scotland for uh, householders, uh, but also the work that I mentioned earlier uh, in developing a cross-tenure housing standard moving beyond uh, the concept of fitness for human habitation uh, and toward uh, standards which deliver homes that underpin health and well-being. Uh, all of that work, I think, will continue to address the issues that the member raises. Uh, question number three has not been lodged. Uh, before I call question number four, I would wish to uh, say that, as members will be aware, a petition for judicial review of the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act 2022 has been lodged with the court. I would make clear, uh, therefore, that questions four and five were in fact lodged prior to the petition for judicial review. However, for the purposes of the sub judice rule, members should avoid referring to matters under consideration in the ongoing judicial review and the specific provisions 
of the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act 2022 that are under challenge. I call question number four, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the effects of the current rent freeze on the availability of rented accommodation. Minister Patrick Harvey. While it is an administrative rather than statistical source, the most recent sector-wide data uh, is from the Scottish Landlord Registration System, which shows that in December 2022, there were 340,149 private rented properties registered in Scotland. That's slightly more than the 339,632 properties that were registered in August 2022. Uh, the Scottish Government monitors landlord registration data on a monthly basis and registration and related data is analysed in our first report to the Scottish Parliament on, on the operation uh, of the Cost of Living Act, published on the 12th of January. Ms Smith. Uh, the Minister will know that a topic of very considerable debate at the Finance Committee of recent uh, weeks has been the concern over behavioural change that some aspects of Scottish Government uh, policy has, and the rent freeze uh, is just one of these. It's all very well to say that it's helping the cost of living situation, which it is, um, but it's also creating some worrying reactions uh, from landlords um, which are now hindering rather than helping the housing market. Can I ask if the Scottish Government recognises the serious concern about that? Minister. Well, I'm very pleased that Liz Smith acknowledges that the actions that we're taking uh, and have taken do help the cost of living crisis uh, and are necessary for, uh, for people in, in that context. Uh, I'm aware of surveys that are being carried out by landlord bodies uh, which look at the possible intentions of landlords in the future. Uh, I would caution that uh, it's difficult to interpret those because it relates to what landlords may or may not choose to do in the future. It also doesn't directly translate into the number of properties uh, that might be affected, and nor does it take into account uh, new landlords entering the sector either. Uh, there has, as I said in my first answer, been no fall in properties on the landlord registration system. I acknowledge that it would take some time uh, from any decision to sell uh, before the, the sale is completed and the property is deregistered, and so we will continue to monitor trends uh, in the register and uh, other data. I would finally just say that over the longer term, it's really important to acknowledge that since devolution, uh, the Scottish Household Survey shows a very significant growth uh, in private rented sector tenancies through a period of increased regulation, uh, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. I call question number five, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has conducted on the effect of the rent cap on the number of homes available for rent in the private sector. Minister. Well, Obviously, I would uh, refer Mr Simpson to the answer that I was uh, just giving to Liz Smith, uh, but private renting is a dynamic sector. It's made up of tens of thousands uh, of small-scale landlords with constant coming and going uh, within the sector. Those landlords who leave the sector may in turn sell to other landlords, and uh, of course new landlords also enter the sector. Over the long term, since devolution, the size of the private rented sector has significantly more than doubled, even through a period of generally tightening regulation. Uh, and as the uh, report from the cross-party group on housing, uh, which Mr Simpson is involved with, acknowledged, regulated markets uh, can, in fact, be attractive to institutional investors. Graham Simpson. Well, um, can I thank the Minister for that answer, but he does appear to be uh, in denial uh, over this, because data from Property Mark shows that 85 per cent of letting agents have reported that landlords uh, want to sell up. And the Scottish Prop Property Federation estimates that £700 million in residential investment has been paused or lost. So will the Minister at least accept this, that if you impose policies like blanket rent freezes, that can have negative consequences. Minister. Um, I mean, I would, uh, I would remind Mr Simpson of what I've said repeatedly, and I, I hope that he's, uh, in fact, not the one in denial of the reality that the number of properties registered in the private rented sector has not decreased. It has slightly increased over the, the first 
uh, three months between August and December, and we will keep that under review. The, the work that, uh, that Mr Simpson refers to as data is surveys of landlords' possible intentions in the future. Uh, it, it is not data about properties actually being deregistered and no longer being available in the private rented sector. And finally, I would come back to this wider point uh, that if we look not only at the, the last 20 years or so uh, of uh, the private rented sector more than doubling in a period of tighter regulation, but also at the experience of a number of other European countries with a more regulated rental market and a bigger and more viable rented market than we have in this country, it is perfectly clear that an approach that seeks to achieve uh, everyone's uh, human right to adequate housing uh, is entirely compatible with a viable rental market. I call question number six, Fulton McGregor, who's joining us remotely. Mr McGregor. <laughs> uh, Mr McGregor, we can't hear you. Could, could you maybe do something at your end to sort that out? To ask the Scottish ah, Government could, how uh, many Mr. children... Mr. McGregor, could, could you just start from the be right from the beginning again? Thank you. We didn't hear any of it. Please start again. Thank you. OK, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many children are estimated to be eligible for the Scottish Child Payment in the Cope Bridge and Christen constituency? Minister Ben McPherson. Official statistics for Scottish Child Payment are routinely published by Social Security Scotland, including application and payment data by local authority area. The Scottish Fiscal Commission produce estimates and forecasts of eligibility for the Scottish Child Payment, but only for Scotland as a whole and, and not by region. However, internal Scottish Government analysis suggests around 7,000 children in the Cope Bridge and Christen constituency could be eligible for the Scottish Child Payment each year from 22-23 to 27-28. Uh, the Scottish Child Payment is getting mon money to low-income households at a crucial time uh, and more families than ever are eligible su for support, which is a, a good thing for Mr McGregor's constituents and, and all across Scotland. Uh, Mr McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. This payment will indeed make a significant difference to families in my constituency and in the face of soaring inflation caused by UK government economic mismanagement, it is most welcome that the Scottish Government has continued to prioritise investment in measures that will help eradicate child poverty. I am aware the Scottish Government is investing significantly more in Social Security than the funding it receives from the UK Government. Can the Minister outline what this spending will achieve? Minister. Well, in 2023-24, uh, we are committing £5.2 billion for benefit expenditure, uh, providing support to over 1 million people. And this includes £442 million for the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, this £5.2 billion is £776 million above the level of funding forecast to be received to, by the Scottish Government from the UK Government uh, through block grant adjustments. Um, this choice we have taken represents a significant investment in people and is key to our national mission collectively to tackle child poverty. Uh, it will help low-income families with their living costs, support older people to heat their homes in winter uh, and enable uh, disabled people to live uh, full and independent lives. I call question number seven, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with East Renfrewshire Council. Minister Ben McPherson. Uh, ministers and officials have regular meetings with representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including East Renfrewshire Council, uh, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people and communities of Scotland. We also, of course, meet with COSLA on a regular basis. Uh, East Renfrewshire Council have never specifically uh, requested to meet me, uh, but if they ever did want to do so, I would, of course, be open to such an invitation. Paul O'Kane. I, I thank the Minister for that answer. I, I know he spoke about partnership working, but he will recognise COSLA's disappointment that the Government have refused to engage once again on local government finance. Indeed, the much acclaimed £550 million in additional funding for local authorities is political spin. The figure has been condemned by COSLA, and new analysis has revealed the reality is more just like £38 million. East Renfrewshire Council has been dealt with a flat cash settlement, despite inflation soaring at over 9%, with the Council facing a £30 million shortfall. Given 
given the proportion of income that comes from the government's general revenue funding, local authorities are being forced by this SNP government to either make unthinkable cuts to local government services and or to raise council tax. So I would ask the Minister, what choice would he advise East Renfrewshire to make? Reduce school opening hours or make large increases to council tax? And when will this government get back round the table with councils like East Renfrewshire and give communities a fair deal? Minister. Well, I can assure the member that Scottish Government ministers meet with COSLA as a representative body for local authorities on a regular basis uh, and have done in recent weeks and indeed there will be further engagement later today. Um, in terms of the, the, the financial situation, it is factually correct to state that local government, the local government settlement has increased by over £570 million in cash terms. And that is in the context of our settlements from the UK government having suffered a decade of austerity with uh, average real terms cuts of more than 5% equating to a loss of £18 billion. And in that context, we are increasing the resource available to local government by, as I've said, £570 million, which is a real terms increase of £160.6 million, uh, or 1.3%. But I appreciate the the, the strong feelings on this matter from local government and members, and I can assure the member and other colleagues that we are engaged constructively and seriously with local government. And if Mr O'Kane has suggestions with regard to the budget process, he should submit constructive proposals to finance ministers, because that is the, the, the way that we need to engage in this position where the Scottish budget has been affected significantly by inflation, the public finances are under pressure in the round, and we need to be solution-focused together, and, and I'm sure if he has any, uh, that my finance colleagues would welcome any constructive suggestions. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. As question number eight has been withdrawn, and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to take their positions. Thank you.